Chapter 53, The Migration It was the night before the migration, and Bright Bill was sleeping fitfully. Roz watched him toss and turn until he finally crawled up into her arms, and she rocked him to sleep just like the old days. Early the next morning, Bright Bill waddled outside and looked at the pond. The water was perfectly still, a few lazy clouds drifted above. Geese were already gathering by the beach, and then tiny claws scampered down from the treetops. So today's the day, huh? said Chit Chat, perched on the branch. You're going to see so many new things and meet so many new animals, and if there are any squirrels at your wintering grounds, please tell them that Chit Chat says hello. Today is the day, said Bright Bill. The flock will be leaving soon. Are you excited or nervous or scared? I'm all those things, the squirrel whispered. Well, don't worry about your mother. I'll look after her so you know she'll be perfectly fine. Bright Bill smiled. I'm afraid it's time to go, and Roz as she stepped out of the nest, said Roz as she stepped out of the nest. Okay, Mama, said the gosling. See you in the spring, chit-chat. Have a nice migration, Bright Bill. The squirrel scampered back into the treetops. Come home with lots of exciting stories, but not too exciting because I don't want anything scary to happen to you. Goodbye. The geese were honking with excitement and hustling around as they made their final preparations. Several of the fathers huddled together discussing their flight plans while the mothers took a head count. There you are, Bright Bill, loud wing honked from the middle of the crowd. We're just about to begin. May I have your attention, please, said the biggest goose. As most of you know, my name is Longneck, and I'll be leading this year's migration. I'm asking everyone to please join your families for takeoff. Once we're all airborne, each family will take its position in our V formation, and we'll start the first leg of our journey. Are there any questions? I have a question, came a booming voice. My son will not have any family with him. Where does he fit into the formation? Everyone turned to Longneck. He can fly with me, said the big goose. I hear Bright Bill is a very clever flyer, and I could use his help at the point. A moment later, the geese began flapping and honking and making their way into the air. A cloud of feathers floated down around the robot and her son. You are not a gosling anymore, said Roz. I am proud of the fine young goose you have become. Bright Bill fluttered up to his mother's shoulders. Thanks, Mama. The goose wiped his eyes. Is this where we say goodbye? This is where we say goodbye for now. Spring will soon be here, and we will be together again. I'm going to miss you, said Bright Bill as he nuzzled his mother. I'm going to miss you too, said Roz as she nuzzled her son. The goose took a deep breath. Then he shook his tail feathers, flapped his wings, and joined the flock. At first, the geese flew in a disorganized jumble, but each goose slowly drifted into position until the flock formed a wobbly V. At the lead was Longneck, and behind his left wing was Brightbill. They circled in the sky until the V pointed south, and then the geese began their long migration. Roz climbed to the top of a tree and watched as the flock slowly faded into the horizon. Chapter 54, The Winter The island was quiet. The migratory birds had all left. The hibernators were asleep, and everyone else had begun their simple winter routines. Everyone but Roz. Now that she was alone, our robot didn't know what to do with herself. She stood in her gray garden and watched a sheet of ice slowly form on the pond. Sometimes she could hear her good friends, the beavers, going about their business beneath the ice, and she wondered when she would see them again. Roz stood there until snowflakes started drifting down from the sky. The flakes swirled in the breeze and slowly piled up on the ground and on the trees and on the robot. She crouched into the nest, slid the stone door behind her, and sat in darkness. Hours and days and weeks went by without the robot moving. She had no need to move. She felt perfectly safe in the nest. And so, 
her own way, the robot hibernated. Roz's body relaxed. Her quiet whirling slowly stopped. Her eyes faded to black. She probably could have spent centuries like that, hibernating in total darkness, but the robot's hibernation was suddenly interrupted when a shaft of sunlight fell upon her face and carried energy back into her empty battery. Roz's body tensed. Her quiet swirling slowly started. Her eyes began to glow. Hello, I'm Rosum, Unit 7134. But you can call me Roz, the robot said automatically. When all of her systems were up and running again, Roz noticed that she was surrounded by broken branches and piles of snow. The roof of the nest had caved in, and the lodge was now flooded with sunlight. Roz felt more energized with each passing minute, but she also felt cold. Her joints felt stiff and brittle, and her thinking was slow. So she got up, cleared a spot on the floor, and made a fire. The snow inside the nest began to melt, and the robot's sensors began to thaw. And when she was ready, she climbed out through the hole in the roof into a bright foreign landscape. The world Raj, Raz had known was now covered in a thick layer of snow. Tree limbs bent to the ground under heavy sleeves. The dark pond was now pure white. The only sounds were Raz's own crunching footsteps. Faint wisps of steam curled up from the robot's body as she trudged through the forest. Roz plunged a hand into a lump of snow and pulled up a long stick. She snapped it in half and flung both pieces back to the nest. She took a few more steps and picked up a fallen tree. She hacked it into small, smaller pieces and flung them back as well. Then she reached down to another snowy shape, but what she pulled up was not a piece of wood. It was Dart, the weasel. He was frozen solid. Roz stared at his stiff body for a moment, then decided it was best to leave the poor little thing where he was. As the robot continued gathering wood, she found more victims of the cold. A frozen mouse, a frozen bird, a frozen deer. Had all the animals, island animals, frozen to death? No, not all. There were a few fresh tracks in the snow. As we know, the wilderness is filled with beauty, but it's also filled with ugliness, and that winter was ugly. A devastating cold front had swept down from the north and brought dangerous temperatures and huge amounts of snow. The animals had prepared for winter, but nothing could have prepared the weaker ones for those long nights when the temperature plummeted and the wind whipped over the island. Roz returned to the nest where, she, where the fire she had, had melted the interior snow to a muddy soup. She took a minute to warm her body by the flames, and then she began the repairs. She patched up the hole in the dome with a lattice work of branches before adding a layer of mud and leaves. And soon the repairs were complete. But another snowfall might cave in the nest all over again, so Raj decided to keep a fire going day and night to prevent snow from building up on the roof. The robot brought in load after load of firewood. And each time she went outside, she was reminded of the frozen weasel and mouse and bird and deer. How many other frozen animals were hidden beneath the snow? Before going in for the night, she called out to whoever was listening, Animals of the island, you do not have to freeze. Join me in my lodge where it is safe and warm. Chapter 55, The Lodgers Firelight spilled out from the nest and into the cold, blustery night. Raj sat inside and listened to the wind and to the soft pops and crackles of burning wood. And then the robot's keen hearing picked up another sound, tiny footsteps crunching through the snow. Raj, I'm freezing. Can I join you by the fire, please? said a weak voice. Into the light crawled Chit Chat. The squirrel was shivering and clumps of ice stuck to her fur. When she finally felt the heat of the fire, she collapsed. Raj picked her up off the floor and gently placed her on warm stones and let her sleep. An hour later, there were more footsteps, and a family of hares shuffled into the nest. They huddled together in a corner without saying a word. Pink Tail, the possum, was the next to arrive. Good evening, she mumbled, trying to act cheerful. 
it certainly has been ch chilly. Swooper, the owl, hobbled in, followed by some chickadees and a magpie. Fink knew a good thing when he saw it, and the fox lay down by the fire. Then came Dig Down, the groundhog. The fuzzy bandits carried in an old turtle named Craig, who was in the worst shape of all. Creatures who should have been hibernating deep underground had been roused by that vicious weather. Only the healthiest animals with the warmest homes were safe. More and more weary animals appeared, and slowly the lodge filled up. This was the first time many of the lodgers had seen fire, and they gazed at it in, with a mixture of fear and hope. They could feel the fire's destructive power, but they could also feel its healing power as it warmed their bones. The lodgers seemed to push forward, eager to feel more warm, and then pull back, afraid of feeling too much. It was important that the lodgers understood fire, so Raj showed them how to build one. She showed the smaller animals how to arrange the kindling, and she showed the bigger animals how to arrange the logs. Bumpkin, Lumpkin, and Rumpkin struck the fire stones together, and everyone cheered when they finally managed a spark. As Raj looked around, she saw moles curling up beside an owl, a mouse snuggling between two weasels, hares nestling against a badger. Never before had the robot seen prey and predators so close and peaceful, but how long could the peace possibly last? I propose a truce, said Roz, like the dawn truce. Everyone must agree not to hurt or harm one another while in my lodge. Very well, said Swooper, after consulting his carnivorous friends. We hunters will control ourselves. Then it's settled, said Roz. My home is a safe place for all. One by one, the lodgers each fell into a deep sleep. Even the nocturnal creatures, usually wide awake at that hour, gave in to the coziness of the nest. The robot stood out of the way and quietly tended to the fire as her guests slept through the night. Only when daylight was streaming in through the door did the lodgers finally begin to stir. You are all welcome to stay here as long as you would like, said the robot as the animals rubbed sleep from their eyes. My home is your home. Thanks a lot, Roz. Fink carefully stepped over a hare and a woodpecker on his way to the door. I don't think I would have survived another night on my own. It's just too bad we can't cram a few more creatures in here. And the fox slipped outside. The robot looked down at the fur and feathers that now carpeted the floor. The nest had been completely full that night. If any more animals showed up, they'd be left out in the cold. But Roz was not about to let that happen. Chapter 26. The New Lodges. The second lodge would have to be bigger than the first if it was going to fit Broadfoot the bull moose. He was a towering hulk of an animal and had a thick coat of fur, but even he was struggling with the frigid temperatures. Broadfoot lived on the other side of the pond in a dense section of forest that was home to many animals, most of whom were in desperate need of a good thaw. The winter days were short, so there was no time to waste, and rather than walking all the way around the pond, Roz tested its frozen surface to see if it was safe to cross. She threw a heavy stone high in the air and watched it bounce off the hard ice. Then she carefully walked over the ice and into the forest on the other side, where she found Broadfoot waiting for her. The moose quietly led the robot to the clearing in the trees where the new lodge would go. Then Raj made a fire and watched as cold creatures began crawling out from the shadows. Do not worry, the robot said to the growing crowd, steam puffed from their noses. You will all be warm soon, but I need your help. Roz asked the animals to collect anything useful that they could find. Large stones, strong branches, chunks of frozen mud. With the robot's building expertise and the small army of helpers, construction of the second lodge didn't take long. The animals happily agreed to the robot's truce, and then they shuffled into the warm wooden dome. If you keep the fire alive, it will keep you alive, said Roz, as she dropped another log into the flames. But be careful, fire can turn deadly in an instant. At dawn, heavy snow was falling again, and there was Roz, setting out 
from the nest to build a third lodge. She trudged into the great meadow where fierce winds had created enormous sweeping snowdrifts, but she powered through the, and finished the job, and soon beginning work on a fourth lodge and then a fifth. The island became dotted with lodges that all glowed warmly through those long winter nights, and inside each one, animals laughed and shared stories and cheered their good friend Roz.